Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you believe that there is more to life than what you see right now and you want to find out more, listen in as her guests share their journey and their extraordinary experiences. Now, here is your host, Rhonda Grant. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show. Sometimes the universe has a way of placing people or obstacles in your path to help guide and direct you on your mission. Listen in as we discover the path my guest has traveled. Has she been inspired by a calling, crafted her journey, or a bit of both? I invite you to embrace the conversation and to use it to help you to recognize if this is happening in your life. Our guest today is Lloyda Nicholas Lewis, who went from an inspiring nun to a global badass CEO. Lloyda is an Asian American businesswoman, lawyer, philanthropist, and civic leader. Mrs. Lewis is the first Asian woman to pass the New York bar without attending law school in in the United States. She worked as general attorney in the New York federal office from 1978 to 1988. After winning her discrimination case against the Immigration and Naturalization Services. She served as CEO of TLC Beatrice International from 1994 to 2007, a $2.2 billion multinational food company with operations all across Europe. She assumed its leadership after the untimely death of her husband, Wall Street financier Reginald F. Lewis, the first African-American to create a billion-dollar company. She released her memoir, Why Should Guys Have All the Fun, this year and was number one in Amazon's new releases for eight weeks. Welcome to the Rhonda Grant Show, Lorda. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, Rhonda. I I am so pleased to have you on the show. I'm so excited to learn about you and where you grew up and what inspired you to go off in the direction that you went off in. Uh, You mean to say, why did I write the book? Why should guys have all the fun? (laughs) Yes. Yes, yes. Wonderful. You know, as you can see from my accent, I'm not uh, born in the United States. I grew up in the Philippines. Uh And when I passed the bar, my father sent me around the world trip to stop in New York because my sister was studying at Columbia University. Uh And that's how I met Reginald Francis Lewis, the love of my life. We met on a blind date because my boss was going to date my sister. And coming from a very conservative country, the Philippines, we are 85% Catholic. I thought a blind date would be cool. So I said, yes. And my boss, who was Harvard Law graduate, introduced me to Reginald Lewis. And that's how I fell in love. We were married in seven months. And that's why I'm here. I became, I, I, you know, I married him, became a U.S. citizen, yes. raised two kids, two daughters mm-hmm. and uh the whole story is in my book why should why should why should guys have all the fun yeah. an Asian american story of love marriage motherhood and running a billion dollar empire mhm now did you have another course that you could have went down well i grew up in the philippines my uh-huh. father was um, able to become a lawyer, not able to become a politician. He was a very successful businessman. And so of the five children, he chose me, the first daughter. He had two sons, my two brothers, elder brothers. Mm-hmm. But because they were, you know, succeeding him, he was so hard on them. But I was the first girl. So Nina Bonita, I am... I can do anything. He empowered me. And I guess because I was very talkative, 
you know, daring, fearless, ambitious. He said, Lloyd, you will be the lawyer. And so I became a lawyer. And my, his plan for me was to become a politician. So when I was seven years old, he built a movie theater, the only one at that time, named after me, Lloyd Theater. So that when I'm ready for public office, I could run and I already have name recognition. So it makes so much sense. So that was my goal. Philippines, politics, maybe governor of this, you know, mayor, governor of my province and all the way to senator. So that's the other way I could have the that gun. Yes. And it's interesting because I don't know how many years ago that would have been, but he was branding you, right? Like right now, everything is about branding your book, branding yourself, you know, so that people recognize the brand like Coca-Cola or, you know, all the big brands. But it seemed like your father had insight that to, you know, to put you on the theater so that you would be a recognized name even before you became a lawyer. Anybody. I yeah. mean, that's sensational. That's just absolutely sensational because now everybody is, you know, you hire people to brand you to be recognizable because everybody wants to be recognized as, you know, as a, well, all the football teams are, are branded. You know what I mean? It's, it's just really interesting. So you married a man and at that time, did he have that billion dollar company? No, Mr. Lewis, like my father, uh, grew up poor, not ve not very poor, because my father lived with a rich uncle who was very entrepreneurial. And Mr. Yes. Lewis was, um, se his mother separated from his father when he was five and lived with his grandmother with eight, ten other, ten other brothers, I mean, uncles and aunts. Okay. So in a way, he became the 11th grandchild, 11th child although he was a grandchild. And so uh, his mother was out working, you know, single mother. Therefore, it wasn't very easy for him. Mm -hmm. husband. Uh, but what happened? What happened was Mr. Lewis was always considered by everyone since he was the last, last child in a way, you know, as being special. And he would accompany his mother, his grandmother, because the grandmother is the babysitter, say babysitting while his mother was working two jobs. Oh. And she, he would accompany his grandmother to uh, clean white women's homes. Okay. And sometimes the the uh, you know the, the employer, the white woman would say, Why don't you ask your grandson to help you clean the house? Nope, he's special. So from the very start. He was given that self-esteem, that he is special, that he will do great things. And in fact, when he was seven years old, he already knew. Uh, this was one of the aunts who told me, I want to be the richest black man in America when I grow up. Beautiful. So all of that, all of that there. And for my uh, father, because he was, you know, at 12, he went to live with a rich uncle away from his mother since he was orphaned when he was 12. So looking at the uncle having a, a movie theater, having a bowling alley, having a fish pond. I mean, you know, several different businesses. So from a teenager, he knew what this is going to be, you know, as a businessman, a, an entrepreneur like his uncle. So those were the background of two important men in my life. And so when I came over, you know, I sort of absorbed that energy, that DNA, to be mm -hmm. ambitious, to go for the top, to do your best. Mm -hmm. Well, that's just wonderful. Do you feel that your father's influence helped you in your education and help you achieve where you were going? I think the background that being the first girl, and we are two girls, the yes. background of having your father and your mother believing in you, that you can do anything that you mm -hmm. set your to do is very helpful as I was growing up and you know as I was I was growing up so I, I you know I was class salutatorian in grade six class valedictorian in high school I, I gave the speech um 
high school, college, I was cum laude with honors. And for College of Law, I was in the top 10 of our graduating class. So it sort of like became a habit of doing your best, being number one. And if you can be number one, number two, or whatever it is, just doing your best. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that's the reason when I came from a Catholic high school, Catholic mm -hmm. all-girls school in college, that I wanted to be a nun. Uh, I wanted to be a nun. Why? Because yeah. I saw how the lives of the women in high school from Germany coming to the Philippines, you know, God forsaken, who knows what the Philippines is when you were in, growing up in Germany and for college, Belgian nuns. So I thought, what a life to devote yourself to something worthy, service to others, bringing them to Christ. So that's why when I was in law school, I was going to enter the convent. Incredible. So how did you know which road to take? All right. It's all written in my book, Why okay. Should <laughs> the Ball the Fun? All right. Yeah. It's really my mother. My mother said, Loida, if you're going to the, your, your second year college, you have two more years to go. Why don't you just finish that, pass the bar, and then the merchandise is in your head. Wherever you're in, in the nunnery, you're outside the nunnery, whatever, you carry the merchandise in your head. And I said, that makes sense. So I told Mother Superior, I'm not ready. I can't come in. Because I was given a date, July, July, um, I was given a date, July 4, Independence Day. Yeah. And I told Mother Superior, Mother Gu, she's French, uh -huh. that I, I cannot come in. I, I I have to finish my yeah. and then she was very understanding. I understand when the fruit is not ready to fall, it can't fall. Okay, you're not ready. So so I left. I mean not left. I did not enter. And I finished my law school. I passed the bar. Mm -hmm. And then my father sent me on a round the world trip to come to the US and Europe and back. And he will start my career. So that's my whole tragic story. Yes. Well, it was very good advice from your mom to advise you to finish your college degree, right? Because it's almost as if all of the rest of it was waiting for you, which was not the school, not going to, to be a nun, right? Because you have had a fantastic life with what you have done. So you got married, you married Mr. Lewis. And can you tell us about that? Yeah, it wasn't easy. Because oh. as driven and as ambitious and as, you know, type A, as you can see from my, my from this interview, yeah. Mrs. Mr. Lewis is double that, triple A, more <laughs> driven, more ambitious. Yes. Okay. And never accepting no for an answer. In mm -hmm. fact, you know, as he was as we were courting, I told him, No, I don't want to see you again two times. And the third time we were supposed to get married, I called him and said, I can't go through with it. I have to go back to the Philippines. Three times I said no. But on the third time, as I was on my way to the Philippines, I had a change of heart. Mm. I was so, so depressed that I will never see him again. Mm. And that's when my friend who was studying in Stanford for his doctorate said, Loida, if you're that sad, why don't you just call him? I said, oh, never thought of that. Tire him back. Darling, I'm coming back. Aww. That's chapter three in my book. <laughs> That's chapter three in your book. Well, and when if people purchase your book, I mean, they're going to read all the details. We're just going to skim over the top of it, right? So, thank you yeah. so it's much for sharing yeah. that. Yeah. Why should guys have all the fun? But let okay. me tell you, why did yes. I why did I mention why did I title it that way? Yeah, you know, Mr. Lewis died five years after he bought the billion dollar company Beatrice International Foods. Yes, of course, it took me one year to get over that tragedy, mm -hmm. and I am so glad that I am Christian, that I believe in a loving God, because mm -hmm. that's the one that sustained me. In my heart of hearts, I knew that God will not forsake me. My husband may have begun, but God will not forsake me. Oh, and so it was beautiful. after I recovered myself that I looked at what has he left 
aside mm-hmm. from daughters, where I will be the mother and father to them, aside from the company, he had written part of a book that he wanted to title, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? How Reginald Lewis Created a Billion Dollar Business Empire. All right. So when it came out in 1995, I took it upon myself. Not only that it got finished, I hired Blair Walker to finish it, but I went around the country. I went to France. I went to the Philippines to promote his book, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? So when Catherine Graham, who took over Washington Post, mm-hmm. a little bit like, you know, sudden his, his her husband died, the publisher of Washington Post, mm-hmm. and she took over. And when she turned 75 years old, she had her book, My Own History or something like that. And I, in my mind, when I turn 75, I will publish my book. 75 came and went. I, when I was turning 80. So I called Blair Walker, who was his co-writer, Blair Walker with Blair Walker. And I said, Blair, you've got to write me. You know already one third of my life. I have to write. You have to help me write the beginning before Reginald Lewis and after Reginald Lewis. And he did. And that's why I named my book. His book was Why Should White Guys? My book is... Why should guys have all the fun? An Asian American story of love, marriage, motherhood, and running a billion dollar empire. Mm-hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. What was that like for you uh, to pick up the pieces of the corporation? Well, I knew that it's not going to be easy, but mm-hmm. I, Mr. Lewis, was smart enough to live, to have 51% of the company. You know, Uh I had shares, my two daughters, Leslie and Christina had shares and his shares. So we have 51%. So if there is anyone in the board of directors who would object to becoming my CEO, I could dismiss them and they knew that. So becoming chairman, being voted chairman wasn't a problem. The problem was 1993, it was the worst recession in Europe. Mm-hmm. And a strong leader just died in January 19, 1993. Mm-hmm. And that summer, our business is 50% ice cream in Italy, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in, in Canary Islands, in Norway, you know. Mm-hmm. So it rained in Spain that summer. Everybody <laughs> else, everywhere else, it rained. So All of those factors, when I came in in 1994, our earnings were down. We were close to bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So those were the problems that happened when I took over. Liquidity crisis, crisis with our friends' partners, and crisis with um, just bringing up the company from negative, from a red into black, and thinking Mm -hmm. up help from friends and you know common sense decision like selling our company plane and reducing our space from 35,000 square feet to 10,000 square feet mm-hmm. and reducing reducing, mm-hmm. reducing uh personnel we were 33 mm-hmm. in the corporate office i moved it down to just 10 mm-hmm. <laughs> so making mm-hmm. common sense decision uh, those are but- tough decisions to make stepping into that role Yes, but mm-hmm. also being fair to mm-hmm. those that I'm going to let go, giving them very generous separation pay, mm-hmm. and uh, seeing to it that the support staff, the secretaries, have a job and not yes. be left, you know, hanging in the wind. Mm-hmm. So we called up Paul Wise to take them because they were very good, uh, you know, very good uh, assistants, mm-hmm. and they're still there up to now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're still there up to now, yes. Yes, meaning to say a profit with honor. I had to cut down because otherwise... You have to, yes. Get, you know, we'll, the, the, the entire ship would fall, would mm-hmm. crash and be a Titanic. But the only way will be, for me, it was common sense. Your earnings are down. Mm-hmm. Income, but it's wisdom. Mm-hmm. It's expenses. 
your earnings are down, your income is down, but your expenses is the same. So you'll have to balance it. You have to increase income, but reduce expenses. So mm -hmm. in the first year, I already had a plus in the black, one million. Perfect. Net income. And the next year, five million net income. And the third year, nine million net income. And the fourth year, 15 million net income. And then that's when I decided to liquidate the company mm -hmm. by selling it piece by piece by piece by piece. So I paid down all that. Mr. Lewis borrowed, was supposed to borrow 1 billion. And he was very smart. He sold all companies, 64 companies in 31 countries. But he didn't need to keep it all. So he sold companies in Australia, in South America, in London, in uh, China, and kept and kept um, Western Europe, supermarket, ice cream, potato chips, and uh, some other things. So by the time I came in, there was still $350 million leverage buyout debt. By the time I was ready to sell, to deliquidate, I, I re eliminate. I we had no more zero debt. We had zero mm -hmm. debt. Mm -hmm. Then I sold piece by piece by piece, and I got one billion back. Excellent. Yes, and as the company began to grow again, then you had to hire more people. No, no, no. By liquidating it, I reduced it to from one billion. Well, I I, I reached two point four billion in in, in revenue. Mm -hmm. So I exceeded Mr. Lewis income revenue, the revenues. It went up to 1.8 billion. By the time I was ready to liquidate the company, we had $2.4 billion in revenue. And when you decide to sell everything, then you reduce, 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 reduce. Mm -hmm. Until you know, I sold everything. And yes. I got one billion back. My shareholders were happy. Oh, yes. Very happy. But uh, when um, the crisis of 93 happened and you had to lay people off or uh, then when you were building your company back up again, you had to hire people back, right? In order to. No, no corporate office. The corporate office remained slim, slim. OK, because our businesses was in Europe and it's our managers who had to hire and the reason why I increased the income was because our partners in France, the Beau family, uh -huh. Jean and Jack Beau, and his their brothers, I mean, their sons, Robert, and, well, two brothers run it, and their fathers. Mm -hmm. They were, they had started, they had started a company that was like Benetton, which mm -hmm. means everything in that store, a small supermarket, called leader price is named leader price but when you bite into the crackers it mm -hmm. tastes like it's crackers you drink their leader price cola it tastes as close to coca-cola and all the things in that store is named leader price but it's 30 percent lower than the name brand and so it grew by leaps and bounds mm -hmm. and that's why i was able to raise income from it started with Mr. Lewis, leader price only had maybe five or 10 stores. By the time I left, they had 450 stores all over France. Mm. Incredible. So that's, that's why I increased the, so much. It was the supermarket that gained and increased the, the numbers of people in Europe, not in corporate office. In the corporate office, we remained slim and lean. Mm -hmm. And did you find that your college degree and, and your lawyer degree assisted you in finessing what you needed to do after Ms. Mr. Lewis's death? Definitely. The mm -hmm. law degree, and that's what I tell many, many young women who yes. do not do, take law. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it will prepare you for anything, everything. It will not make you hesitant to look at contracts. Of course, I hired lawyers, even though I'm a lawyer myself, but it does not phase me. It mm -hmm. does not um, make me, oh, 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 I don't know what in here. No, no, I'm a lawyer. I can look at some contracts and know what is in it, but better to hire the specialist, business exactly. lawyer. Exactly. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you're in business, 
you must have a good accountant, a business accountant, and a business lawyer. Yes, exactly. Well, because there's so many different uh, specialties within that practice, right? And you were better off, there was a better use of your time at the time, rather than, you know, going over contracts, why not have somebody who knows exactly what they're doing? And then you feel confident about that. And if you don't know, changes that are in the contract, well, then that's your, you have the education to ask those questions, right? Yes, you're not intimidated. You're not intimidated. And it's easy to be intimidated in the corporate world, isn't it? Yes. And the law degree, uh, you know, you're grinded with words, words, words. So words will not phase you. That's mm -hmm. why for women who do not know what to do yet, and they like reading, and they like arguing, and they like to be, <laughs> you know, they want to be always right. Yeah. <laughs> but now, on the other side, okay, uh, my own is that I don't always have to be right. Why yeah. will we arguing with, you know, friends, best friends? I know. I always have to be right. Is yeah. that not ego? Just listen. You say your word, your piece, and then that's it. I agree to be, this, that we have a disagreement. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to pound and pound and tell them, I'm right, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't make for good relationship. No, and everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but I don't believe that you're entitled to shove your opinion down somebody else's throat. And it's you end up with no friends because it's not comfortable for them either. And if they're doing that back to you, then it's just tug of war, right? Exactly, especially for newly married, husband and wife. Yeah. All right. And the mm -hmm. women, because of women's liberation, think that they have to always to be right. Yeah. You know, they have always to be on top. I yes. mean, you know, it's different. I mean, you, you're in a relationship. Give a break. Give him a break. Let him say what he wants. You said what you want. Let him say what he wants. Don't argue anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's not important to be always right. You're wrong and I'm right. I mean, you know, is that important in a relationship? Mm -hmm. But how do you even know that you're right? I mean, you're right based on the information that you know right now. But maybe you're not right in five years from now. You know what I mean? Like you change your mind. And so, yeah, I don't uh, get involved in things like that. I rather listen if somebody is really wanting to get their point across and they really are committed and, you know, and you know that that's it, that they're not changing your mind. It, there's nothing I can say or do. And it doesn't matter what I think. I can think myself what I want to think. And I don't have to share that with anybody. Right. And not even the person that <laughs> not, thinks that they're right. <laughs> no, I always believe something said is something heard. If you yeah. are quiet, then it's a tacit compliance. Oh, yes. Whatever you're saying and you say nothing, when you think it is wrong, it's unjust, it's unfair, it's mean. You have to say something. Mm -hmm. Just say it. And period, the end, Third, but shut your mouth. But you said it. Uh -huh. You have to say it. Yes. And there's a lot of um, strength in quietness as well, right? And being a witness to them while they're projecting whatever they're projecting on the person that they're projecting it on. And I think that, talk to me about grace. There's a point I, for women, I can't speak about men because I don't know this, but for women, there's a point where we step into a grace that we have the wisdom uh, because of our years of what we've went through, what we've endured. And I have a hard time articulating this because I'm still figuring it out myself that sometimes we can just be quiet. And we don't need to shove things down people's throat anymore because we've done enough of that over our years, right? And I think that uh, when we enter that stage, and I wish we could enter it earlier in life, that we stop the struggle. Because I think that women, you know, men have always basically worked. And then women had to step into the business world. And women, I think, felt that they needed to be a man 
stepping into a business world, which made them unattractive because we have as women so many skills that we can develop that make us unique in how we do business. And women are very successful business women. And you are a, a testament of that, right? And um, so speak to me about that. What is What do you feel about that? No, I, I do agree with you 100% that we are women and they are men. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to copy them in order to be effective. To own your to your, your own true self, be true or something like that. Yes. Meaning to say, be the authentic woman that you are. Of course, you know, there are some exceptions. There mm -hmm. are some women who have within themselves the, you know, the desire or meaning the minority group of women mm -hmm. yeah. who are within themselves men. So I'm not talking about them. Okay. I'm talking about nurturing women, mm -hmm. women who wants to be go out there in the world, but you don't have to be a man. You don't mm -hmm. have to be cursing here and there, F-U-C-K and, you know, M-F. You don't yeah. have to. You, yeah. you, we, by ourselves, by the way we are formed, by the way we, you know, we become women, mm -hmm. our own inner strength. For heaven's sake, we can give birth. Mm. You know, we are mothers. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean fathers cannot be a mother. No, I no. mean to say, you know, women have their special. We can do it not better, but differently. Yes. And that's where I think every woman have to find for herself her yes. own true self. Her own true self. And within finding her own true self, that's where her unique power is. And I don't mean power is like power driven or anything like that, but the authenticity of the strengths, that's a better word, isn't it? The strengths that we have in this modern society that we're in that continues to evolve. You're listening to the Rhonda Grant show right now, whose podcast has been treated with digital audio health by my sponsor, Symatrex. And I'm speaking with a most famous person, Mrs. Loda Lewis, please let our audience know about the book, not only that you've written, but Mr. Lewis has also written his book and also where they may reach out to you. Yes. So both Mr. Lewis, my book, 95, this was printed in 95 and has been a bestseller in, in uh, Business Week. And mine is just, just came out this year in March 28th in time for Women's History Month. So his book is Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? And my book is Why Should Guys Have All the Fun? An Asian American Story of Love, Marriage, Motherhood, and Running a Billion Dollar Empire. Beautiful. You can find it in Amazon.com or Target or your closest bookstore because they should have it. And if they don't, tell the bookseller, please order it. I'm going to have a book club discussion with my friends or whatever. Yes, yes and will. and they will order and they will order it, which is really nice. And especially if you do have a book club, they are still rampant. Order them for the, everybody in the club and then have them pay you or have them go pick them up at uh, the bookstore. It's such a wonderful education. It really is. Do you feel that you've been called to your journey, crafted it, or a bit of both? Y yes. You know, if you stay close to God or to the universe or whatever spirituality you're following, yeah, there will be moments in your quiet where you are impelled to do something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's day to day. You know, every day, you know, I do right. What am I supposed to do this month? It's, so, it's sort of like my goals for this month. Yeah. And then every day, you know, have I done this or that? Because there's just so many we are called to so many different directions. Yes. And if we don't have a goal, one, two, three, or just even one, mm -hmm. then we can be like a ship without direction, flowing here and going there and, you know, moving here and moving there. Mm -hmm. So I do call, I do believe that all of us, not only me, but all of us have a calling to do something. And it has to be, to be doing of service. I mean, you know, a painter, the calling is to create a masterpiece coming from his own heart. A composer, 
you know, even a garbage collector, his calling is to see to it that this, the, the streets are clean. I mean, all of us have a calling to serve. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, you know, that's that's the calling that I have. Yes, that's just beautiful. Yes, and you just don't want to be a boat adrift on the ocean, right? You do want to have some direction for your own life. And then the call of service is a beautiful calling. It really is. Yes. May I share what St. Ignatius does, what you call discernment? How Please do you do. discern? There are two roads coming before you, and one is opposite from the other. And so he said, imagine yourself on this road. Imagine yourself who are people around you, what you are doing, you know, where you are seated, where is the situation? Just imagine yourself maybe for one day in that situation, in that okay. calling or in that situation. Okay. And then the next day, go to the other side. What's calling, What? where are you calling from or where you are, what situation, who are the people around you? And one of those two where you will feel lighter, where you will feel a little bit heavier, a little bit happier, a little bit breathing better. So that's where you should go. That's how he said, when two roads diverge in the woods and I mm -hmm. chose the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. So that's, that's a beautiful from, teaching. That's from Robert Frost. Two roads diverge in the woods. Yes, the, Robert Frost. Yes, so, so for those who are listening, a situation like that may come. Two men or two women are after mm -hmm. you. You don't know where to go. So imagine that. With that mm -hmm. person, how would you feel? With this person, how would you feel? Mm -hmm. And one of them, you'll feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's easy to make mistakes along your path and then look back and say, I should have, I should have, I shouldn't have. Right. Uh, yeah. That's a really good yeah. teaching. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know about that. Yes. Wonderful. What extraordinary. Wait, one last thing. Mm -hmm. One, Rhonda. Yeah. It's all right to make mistakes. It's yes, all tell right. me about that. Tell me, tell yes. the audience about yes. that because yes. people are afraid to venture on a path because they're afraid to make a mistake. Now, please tell us why you yes. should make mistakes. <laughs> I, no, I understand your hesitation. All right. But if you don't go into an opportunity that comes, it might not come again. Mm -hmm. So you'll just have to trust your own heart and then just go into it. And if you fail, it's okay. That's a human condition. It's not the end. It's not the end. I always say, everything will be all right in the end. If it's mm -hmm. not all right, it's not the end. So if you fail, yes, you cry. Yes, you, you feel bad, etc. But you have to learn from it. What did you do wrong? What happened there? Why was it wrong? And then if you learn from it, you won't commit the same mistake again because sometimes <sighs> women especially, they go do the same thing again. Yeah, sometimes so they do. Learn. You have to learn why did you fail? Mm -hmm. All right. So for myself, I failed three times. After mm -hmm. I was so successful, pride comes before the fall. I was so successful with TLC Beatrice. Every you know, one of the shareholders sent me champagne bottle, Dom Perignon. Somebody, somebody else treated me, treated us, you know, for, <laughs> for a beautiful lunch. In other words, I felt, oh wow, I'm so good. I'm hot shot, an entrepreneur, businesswoman. And but I failed one, two, three times to buy a company. And the fourth <laughs> time, bankruptcy when I bought it. And so what does it tell me? What did I learn? I'm not ready to devote 24-7. There was no more fire in my belly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned. So no more investment. Anybody who comes to me, Lord, that it is such a wonderful, very lot of money. I will listen. I will give you advice, but no investment. Mm -hmm. So I learned I'm no longer in the business of, of running a business. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Yeah. You may fail. Life Life happens, but you can rise again. Tomorrow yeah. is the day. What is that song? The sun will come up tomorrow. tomorrow. You know, so don't be afraid to take on an opportunity. You know, mm -hmm. you may succeed. 
you may succeed. So you will, if you don't, then, and that opportunity doesn't come again, then there will always be regret. Who wants to live with regret? Yeah. Well, who wants to leave this earth with so many regrets? They didn't take chances they didn't take action they didn't take advantage of opportunities sometimes we don't recognize the opportunities until the opportunities pass and we can talk ourselves out of a lot of things and we can talk ourselves into a lot of things but my caution and and let me know how you feel about this is you have to be careful who you share your ambition with because if that person is would be afraid to take any steps towards having their own business or something, then they might be a naysayer and they might frighten you into not taking a chance, right? Yes. Okay. In in, in terms of entering into business, mm-hmm. it's just that, oh, I have an idea. I mean, you have to do the work. You have yes. to investigate. You have to call other business owners. You have to, you know, it's a lot of work. Thousand things. So it's just not, oh, I have a brilliant idea. That's not enough. No. Got to do the due diligence, they call it. You've got to do the work. You've got to do investigation. You've got to see, you've got to have a plan. And you have to help, you know, (laughs) get the help. If you don't know, get the help from somebody. Yes. Idea is not enough. It's a lot of hard work. And Mm -hmm. if you say, Oh, I am not ready to hard work. Then, then you don't know, do it. Don't do it. Don't do it because and then in the end, don't say, "Oh, I have a brilliant idea." You know, yes, if you want, go through it, and then you will learn. Mm-hmm. Brilliant idea is not enough. Do you have the track record of doing business? Mm-hmm. Mr. Lewis was selling Afro American newspaper twice a week when he was ten years old going around the neighborhood, delivering the newspaper. And after two years, he wanted to do something else. He sold it to his best friend. Mm -hmm. So at 10, already the business of buying and selling, buy low, sell high, you know, keep good records, buy low, sell high, keep good records. And so when you are 21 after college, you have a big idea. You've got to, you know, plan it. Mm -hmm. Step by step, one foot in front of the other. You know, not just a brilliant idea. So, yeah. And being in business, uh, people say, you know, my time's my own. No, your time is for the company. And um, once that company is starting to make a profit, then you, you can have some time to your own. But <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you know, and I think that people think that business owners, um, they they have a lot of free time and business owners don't have a lot of free time. They're, they have to, they have to meet the challenges. They have to meet the payroll. They have to meet, meet, meet all the time. Uh, but an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur and they thrive on that because it keeps that flame going, right? The entrepreneurship That's right. flame. That's right. It yeah. takes a lot of time and a lot of thinking and, and the devoting time and all that to be a success. But this is what I warn business owners. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're doing but don't think that that's it. You've got to think of an exit plan. Why? Exit, because yeah. at a certain time, mm-hmm. if you are at a certain time, there is a time to sell. Yes. Okay. There is a time to also to keep. And you must be very, very perceptive mm-hmm. on whether there's a time to sell. And you sell because that opportunity might not come again. It happened to me. Yeah. We had a supermarket in China. Mm-hmm. And it was going gangbusters and a uh, supermarket company in Singapore wanted to buy it. But there were some elements in the contract that I did not like. And yes. so I broke the deal. Uh-huh. And after that, nobody came anymore. I missed the chance. Yeah. So, so for those business owners who are listening, think about it. Be sure you have an exit strategy. Beautiful advice. What extraordinary discovery have you found in your life? Discovery that love conquers all. Oh. Love conquers all. In other words, personal relationship, even in running the business, you have to love what you're doing and yes. to love the employees. 
And every time you have to make a decision, like firing people, okay? You have to do it with love. What is <laughs> fair? So that's why I said, maybe in order to ease my conscience, I have very generous separation pay for all of my executives. <laughs> for this. In fact, I'm so glad because one who was an accountant said, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. And because I gave her generous uh, 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 separation pay, she studied for law. And Fantastic. She, yes, and she worked with Sherman and Sterling. And another one secretary has always wanted to start a daycare. They had a big house in Staten Island and her son, her eldest son, had uh, autism or something like that. Mm -hmm. So she started the daycare and she ran it for 25 years until yeah. her children are in college, including her eldest who was, who, who was, you know, he's working. Yeah. So in other words, you are a business owner and you have to make a drastic decision that will affect the lives of your employees. Mm -hmm. Think about it. What is the fairest way for the business to stand and those that you are going to dismiss, you know, have, have something, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I am very upset when we hear of these big companies like Jeff Bezos buying Twitter and immediately cutting off 50% of his employees. I mean, yeah. it, it boggles my mind. Yeah. It boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty tough out there sometimes, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, but, you know, for those who have been affected by this uh, employment, okay, yes, uh, you know, you suffer with your bruises, you know, whatever. And then go out again mm -hmm. and you know, let your let everybody, you know, let, just tell people, meet people, friends. Mm -hmm. You meet them friends over coffee, you know, and yeah. say, you know, I'm looking for this kind, very particular. What is it? Your bio data. What is it you're looking for? All right. Just spread it out there. Mm -hmm. Don't just stay in your, well, you can stay in your room and mope a little bit. You know, that's natural. And then yeah. go out again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The sun will come up tomorrow. The sun will come up tomorrow. Thank you so much for being on the show, Mrs. Lewis. Uh, yeah, you're call such me a Loida. call me Loida, please. Loida. I I call you Rhonda. Yes, you may call me Rhonda. I may call you Loida. Um, you're such an honorable woman, and um, you you arrive with such grace, such wisdom, and. You have a lot of knowledge, I know that, but your wisdom and it, it not, a lot, not a lot of people have a whole lot of wisdom and that's what you were graced with. You you make really good decisions and uh, you're just a pleasure to speak with. I could talk to you even longer. You just have so much to share and so much to give and I'm going to pick up your book and uh, so that I may read more about you and Mr. Lewis. Yes. Thank yes. you so much for being on the show. You can call me anytime. And thank you very much for having me uh, share your um, social media, share your your time with this Rhonda Grant show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. God bless. God, God bless you. Theme song for the Rhonda Grant show, Sun on the Water, is composed and performed by my friend John Park Wheeler. This is Rhonda Grant with The Rhonda Grant Show, author of Magical Forces Within, Extraordinary Discoveries in an Ordinary Life, inviting you to look for the magical forces within yourself today and every day. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to The Rhonda Grant Show with your host, Rhonda Grant. If you would like to find out more information about Rhonda and her upcoming guests and the work that she does, go to her website, rondagrantauthor.com. That's rondagrantauthor.com. Digital Audio Health by Cymatrax.